so um, hello, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Laurent Tessier. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Catholic University of Paris, and I am vice rector of for digital activities. And uh, I am Michael Bourgat, and I am uh, assistant professor at the Catholic University of Paris too. And I'm the head of the DH Center, L'Atelier du Numérique, which means digital, uh, digital workshop. A DH Center we created three years ago, uh, focusing on three goals, uh, bringing together um, a faculty member uh, engaged in DH research uh, in our university, uh, training fellow researchers to design innovative courses or digital resources, and thirdly, uh, developing digital softwares, applications or services, and implementing uh, innovation in our university. In 2013, as part of the activities of our DH labs, we organized the first conference which led us to the publication of uh, proceedings. During the event, uh, in a DH um, uh, Perspective, we wanted to make scientific papers and panels allowing exchanges between researchers, innovators, and professionals of digital worlds. Following this event, we published proceedings, but the process, like uh, it is always the case in academic world, uh, was long and tedious. It, it took more than a year. Moreover, this conference proceeding only took account for the scientific papers, losing the richness of the event itself and what made uh, DH specificity. Following these experiences, even uh, if the scientific re results were interesting, we listed the items that didn't satisfy us and on which we wanted to, uh, to work. First, during a DH event, there are not only scientific papers, there are also workshops, uh, hackathons, book sprints, several activities that do not find their place in a, a regular conference proceedings. Uh, articles published in conference proceedings do not reflect dynamics and the creativity of the exchanges that occur during the event. And thirdly, the proceedings get published a long time after the event and this is not suitable for the, the pace of science, uh, science sorry, in a digital context. For example, the life itself of the online references inserted in the conference proceedings are not always assured. Very often, when the paper is published, the links are not longer available. So, uh, you could say that uh, the process of the conference, pro the classic, conference proceedings uh, is a good way of dissemination that meets the expectations and the needs of conventional humanities laboratories. But if you're in a DH lab, uh, it quickly seemed to us that there was something new to maybe to, to create. So this is the reason why uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, 2016, uh, when we decided to organize a new uh, scientific event, uh, we thought it was a good opportunity to experiment a new way of disseminating the results of our DH lab. Uh, especially since we wanted to organize um, some kind of hybrid event, which was both a scientific symposium, but also an ed camp, educational camp, so on the model of the dat camps or bar camps. Uh, so all this, these events where uh, sessions can be determined on the day of the event, and anyone who attends can be a presenter, anyone can lead a workshop or engage himself or herself in any activity. So publishing an accurate record of this type of event raises a number of questions that we wanted to take. So uh, first, in the traditional conference, you will have may maybe 10 or 20 people uh, speaking and 100 people listening. Uh, so in a way, editing the proceedings is easy because you just have to ask the 10 speakers to write a text and then you publish it. Uh, while if you run in an ed camp or a dat camp or, or so on, uh, if you have 
100 people attend the event. In theory, these 100 people should participate to the editing of the proceedings. Uh, second difference between a traditional conference and a camp. Uh, in a conference, the speakers prepare the paper before the event, and with the at camp or the dat camp, uh, there is much more content that emerges during the, exchang the exchanges. Uh, and the third point, uh, in the ad camp or the dat camp, uh, and maybe in a lot of DH events, uh, there are now almost as many things happening on social networks uh, as in the conference rooms. Uh, for example, on Twitter and so on. So I could, accounting for this type of event uh, implies also to capture uh, these online exchanges. So for all these reasons, these reasons uh, we wanted to create a new type of proceedings to meet these uh, challenges. In order to move forward and to make this happen, we decided to include a publisher in the process. We did, we did it with uh, Michael Felloni, who can see um, his face on, on the pictures, of the MKF uh, editions, a French publisher who experiments new ways of publishing. While brainstorming with him, we focused on a process born in the field of the, 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 the age, the book sprint. What is a book sprint? A book sprint is a way of creating a book very quickly, for example, a tutorial or a translation of a book by bringing a team uh, of specialists together in a room for, for a short period of time. The result is a book published online or published using the process of the print on demand, and most of the time the book is distributed freely. Thus, the idea was initially to uh, uh, lead a, a book sprint during our at camp, but with a huge difference. We did not want a book made from pre-existing text. Our idea was to edit conference proceeding in real time in a collaborative manner. In that way, we decided to uh, call this dissemination process a media sprint because it was edited in real time and it was not only composed of textual material but also of images and videos. So uh, the core of this experience, of this experimentation, was uh, collaborative note-taking during the event. Uh, to do that, we had to choose a tool allowing this collaborative work. So our first guess was maybe we could use uh, Google Docs, for example, which is maybe the most famous and powerful and easy to grip um, tool dedicated to collaborative writing. But also it seemed to us that in a DH lab, in a DH perspective, uh, maybe this was not the best thing to do. Uh, in our perspective, in this kind of situation, a DH lab should always either try to develop its own tool or use free and open source technologies developed by, by other teams. Uh, and it's only when none of these options is available uh, that the DH lab should choose uh, proprietary tools. Um, so we used an open tool that is called from Framapad, a French tool. Uh, but also we have to say that sometimes the use of proprietary technologies can be necessary. For example, uh, we used a lot of uh, Twitter during the event. Uh, and of course, the use of these commercial services in, your, in a DH lab should always be questioned. During the uh, opening of our ed camp uh, that took place in Paris at the very beginning of uh, the last uh, September, we explained our plans to the participants. First, we encouraged them to use the collaborative page to take notes instead of taking ones on their personal device. And we were pleased to see that they effectively used the page. And we were also pleased that they did uh, tweets, took pictures on Instagram, and so on. 
Michael, our publisher, monitored all this data in live, uh, collecting text, tweets, images, and began editorializing them during the event. At the end of the ad camp, at the end of the second day, a first digital version of the proceeding was available uh, online and shared with the participants. And from this date, they had a week to make correction on the pads before the final digital and paper edition. The result is a, a hybrid uh, editorial object, including text, tweets, photo, flashcards, which refers to the video, and a bibliography, which is not included in the book itself, but edited and accessible on Zotero, uh, also via a flashcard, with the idea to enrich it and to give it a longer life. So, uh, in the end, we are very aware that this hybrid book, uh, hybrid text, is um, not perfect. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we believe that it cannot answer some of the, question, of the questions that we raised. Uh, among the questions that still arise and which we would like to maybe to discuss with you, uh, we can mention two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, how to assign discourses written in a collaborative and partly anonymous way. Um, I give you an example. Uh, if you look at the text uh, resulting from the opening conference, it was given by a professor, Mila Dwey. Uh, what you see in the book is not the discourse of the speaker. The text is the result of what the participants understood and what interested them. So, in the process of taking notes collaboratively, they could miss things or even misinterpret parts of the speech. In order to counterbalance this, we inserted uh, in the text flashcodes to link it to the video of the original speech. Uh, the second question concerns the scientific uses of the book. For example, how does one quote something in that kind of book? Because among the, among the participants named in the book, you have people that are mentioned where, with their full names, but you have also people that appear in the book only uh, with their Twitter ID, and there are also those who contributed anonymously on the pads. So, very uh, prosaically, uh, where to classify the book in your research resume, for example, if, you, if you're in the book? Uh, how to present it. We, we had the, this question just last week, uh, someone that were in the event and read the book and see, okay, this is me saying that, but just my name doesn't appear. So how, how can I use this? Uh, for example, put this in my research resume and so on. These questions that are both scientific, institutional and editorial, uh, seem to us typical of those that uh, that must be solved today in a DH lab. Uh, so we hope that this experiment, this, this media sprint, will, will give you ideas and maybe uh, be taken up and improved by other DH, DH teams. So thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have plenty of time now to ask questions, and I, I guess uh, this kind of presentation really requires questions. Could you explain a bit more on the role of the editor, the media editor that you, that you employed? What kind of control did, did that person have over the process? What kind of model of the output did that person bring into this process? Well, he had a very important role, and of course, the, the work that we had with him uh, before the event, also to make him understand the, uh, the scientific goals, and uh, so make him understand the, the content of the, the event was uh, fundamental. Uh, because he worked all uh, along the two days, so editing like um, Michael said, live, all what was said. Uh, then, of course, uh, he did this first draft, and as uh, Michael said, then all the researchers that were participating to the event had one week to 
make corrections. So because of course, uh, yeah. Uh, this is a question of, uh, of editorializing a book. This is not our work. We don't know how to put the pictures inside the book, where to put the tweets, how to organize the, the discussion or the relationship between tweets, some part of, of notes taken into the pads, videos, etc. So the editors decided, and there is a cost also, <laughs> to uh, time to work, the, the cost of the book, etc. So he, he, he have, uh, it's a question of uh, rationalizing uh, the process in, in a short time with a different type of, of media and, and so on. So this is uh, the reason of the... In, in, we decided to include uh, 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 an editor or publisher into the process. I mean, just to, to clarify, I, f I find this absolutely the right way to go because the, the output, you would otherwise not be able to generate that output almost in real time with the event. But on the other hand, what happens if you get the wrong person to do the job? Because yeah. it's not just layout <laughs> questions. It's also conceptual questions, and that's what, what really interests me. You know, what if you get somebody who is too close to the subject area um, and takes personal yeah. investment into something, into a debate, or if you get somebody who simply doesn't understand it, and you know, you're looking through the lens of an editor, as you do in any edited volume. That's that's sure. Um, and of course, you have this corrective of the of the commentary afterwards, which is fine. But still, so much hinges on the on the quality of that live process. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And, and also, uh, as Michael said, uh, the publisher, the editor, uh, had the power of saying, for example, uh, this idea is very good, but if we do that, it costs uh, <laughs> two thousand euros more. So. Yeah, he had this power also. Artificial intelligence would it solve the problem in a couple of years? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, of course. I, I was going to ask because we've we've done things in UCC with online teaching where we've had people live blogging and tweeting and video, and it occurred to us when you came out of those sessions that what we were looking for to coordinate it was a, a profession that doesn't yet exist because it's not book editing, yeah. and it's kind of like live TV editing, but it's not because there's multimedia in there as well, so that you, you certainly need the facilities of almost a live TV studio, yeah. but you need someone with a very unique set of editorial skills and possibly a couple of assistants to weave all these things together uh, to actually produce a product. And, and it's, it's quite scary when you're in the middle of doing it, you realize that you need a whole set of skills that you haven't got in the one body yet. But it seems like a case where we're actually creating a new professional definition for a new type of editor, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the designer, um, for, sorry, the, the publisher uh, is uh, someone that precisely defines himself as uh, laboratory editing. So he wants to create new f new forms of editing. So it, this kind of also of um, of person. But also in our DH lab, we have a person that is very important that we didn't mention. Uh, that is a designer. Uh, so we work along uh, with the designer all the time to, uh, in this kind of uh, process and events. And the designer is able to take pictures, to take videos, etc. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Sophia Lee. I actually already have a microphone. Oh, sorry, uh, because, uh, yeah. Is it okay? No, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Um, my question is, so did you have any experiences about conflicts or misunderstandings or something like that among the participants? And if so, in what ways would such uh, situations be dealt with? How would you resolve that? What would be the process of coming to a joint resolution and conclusion? Um, it didn't happen. I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't happen because we were very afraid of that, and especially for the uh, opening conference and closing conference, it was two well, very well-known professors, and so uh, well, yeah, we were very afraid that uh, there would 
uh, they they find in the book something that doesn't correspond to what they said, or uh, and, and especially it was interesting in the opening conference, for example, it 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 lasted for maybe 45 minutes, and you see in the conference that uh, there are 20 minutes uh, in the middle of the conference where absolutely no one take notes, so the people were not interested at all. So they, uh, and so, in, in, you know, for the people doing doing this, you, you see, okay, there, there was really 20 minutes of what I said Big that old. just doesn't appear. So that's also interesting in a way, but, yeah. There, there was a... Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this interesting talk. My question is that what is the difference between uh, your initiative and uh, the one uh, undertaken by uh, RT Bedoc in France, that is Réseau Thématique uh, sur le Document Numérique, uh, who the leader was uh, Jean-Michel Salin from NCIP. Uh, so apart from the fact that it is uh, multimedia uh, in unconference proceedings, what is the main difference between this uh, type of initiative and uh, the one uh, under, undertaken by um, uh, Jean-Michel Salin, where it's, it was uh, a network of uh, about uh, four to thousand persons working, and the editor was, um, all, all of us know it was, uh, the chief editor is Jean-Michel Salin, but no one is calling uh, these uh, um, proceedings or publications are uh, uh, a product of uh, Jean-Michel Salin, but of this RTPDOC. I don't know if there is a main yeah, difference. No, obviously it is related. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, we are. Um, there are a lot of initiatives of, of, the, of, this, of this type uh, today, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, our main focus was uh, on the question of proceedings. So uh, that was the, the point from where we, we draw. Um, and the idea was also uh, the idea of uh, getting faster because uh, we were thinking if you experiment things in a DH community uh, getting published uh, two years later. It's it's yeah. too late, yeah. <laughs> so we have to be uh, to be faster. So that was also, uh, but it's related, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah.